Hello and good afternoon, everyone. I am Dr. Gregory Boyce, and I want to again welcome you to uh, our 48th MRF HIV STI Echo Series. Uh, with me in the uh, uh, hub is Dr. Jeffrey Edwards, who's our director and who also is expert in STDs and who's going to give us a presentation today on common sexually transmitted infections because I think it's a constant challenge, especially in, in settings like ours, when patients present with STI symptoms or STI exposure what to do, because I, I always find myself at least once or twice a week wondering what I'm supposed to do here. So I, I think it's never uh, a, a topic that can, that, that can be overdone. I think we always have more stuff to learn, as always good to, to revise what we do already. So again, I just invite everyone, uh, to, if you can, uh, to learn the cameras in the beloved Bill community. And if you have any questions, you could either unmute, raise your hand, or type it in the chat. Yeah. What, what do you have to do? Tell them what you plan to do. Do you have a case afterwards? Yes, sir. so we are having to after the presentation on sexually transmitted infections as the usual echo format. We are going to have a clinical case. Um, and there are a lot of overlapping themes with this case. So and I'm not going to spoil it just yet. So that's the general presentation. Usually it's a didactic presentation followed by a case con conversation. And that's how we all learn together. So also during that uh, case presentation, feel free to ask questions if they become more clear and we'll discuss the various um, teaching points around the case. Because actually the, the, the case is presented to ask a question because we ourselves are not sure. So we're asking for everyone's input and advice and expertise. Thank you so much. All right, Dr. Edwards, let me just start. Okay, good afternoon, folks. So Again, my um, presentation, basically two cases I'm gonna give, but I mean, two cases that have lots of diagnoses. So I want you all to kind of shout out the diagnoses, you know, for me. Um, should be quite interesting for you all. So we'll see how you all feel about it. Um, whenever I to start up the boys, go ahead. So the first case, Jadal. Bartender. He complains of a two-day history of a penile discharge and burning when passing urine. He also complains of severe generalized itching all over the night. He said, Doc, itching, I can't sleep at night. Itching has been going on for about three weeks. Jaden is known to be HIV infected and is on antiretroviral therapy and is viral load is suppressed. He had a history of unprotected sexual intercourse with Tevin, an occasional male partner, five days previously. When we asked Jaden, how come he's having unprotected sex, you're HIV infected, he told us, you equal to you. Undetectable means untransmissible. So in the audience out there, what, what do I mean by you equal to you? Undetectable means untransmissible. Anybody could tell me that? because that's very important for somebody to say so. Anybody else see Cyrus trying to say something? You have to unmute Cyrus. Undetectable means untransmissible. What does that mean for somebody with HIV? Conrad, tell them since they're so shy. It means that if I reach a status of undetectable, I cannot pass the virus on to anyone else. So right, so that's very important. Be untransmittable. Right? right, so that's very important for people up there. So people with HIV now, because of the antiretroviral drugs, all right, their life expectancy is almost normal. So they could expect to, to live you know, into the 60s and the 80s, depending on your family history. And then once you're on antiretroviral therapy and a viral load is suppressed, you no longer transmit HIV sexually. So U equal to U means undetectable, means untransmissible. If you suppress a viral load, you don't transmit. But we still encourage people to use condoms because you could see here, Jaden picked up some STI, all right? So I want you all to go away with that. With antiretroviral therapy, life expectancy is normal. And once the viral load is suppressed, they no longer transmit HIV to sexual partners. Go ahead, next one. So when we examined Jadon, we saw a parallel penile discharge. There were no genital ulcers. He had a firm nodular lesion on the shaft of the penis. And also he also had some papules on the penis, scrotum and groin. 
And then he also had some scaly lesions on the dorsum of the hands. He also had some lesions in the axilla that is under the arms there, all right? And he had some lesions around the umbilicus, around the, 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 the navel, all right? Go ahead. Okay, so this is what we saw when we examined Jaden. You can see this parallel discharge there. Next one, Dr. Boyce. And he also had this strange nodular lesion. I'm sure Dr. Green will be able to tell me that, but hold it for now, Dr. Green. All right. <laughs> All right. So he has a strange thing. I'm trying to figure out what is that? You know, go ahead. And then we also notice he has these papules. You can see papules on the penis there, on the scrotum. And then he had the scaly lesions in between the hands and the webs of the fingers and the dorsum of the hand there. All right. Next one. So what's your differential diagnosis? Anybody, let me hear. I want to make this interactive. What's your differential diagnosis? He has a number of things. Yes. Anybody? Differential diagnosis, you're all too quiet. Dr. Green, enlighten us, tell us, you know. Well, the purulent discharge speaks about the gonorrhea. That's what I would think about with one of the possibilities. For gonorrhea, um, the papules and the penis. Uh, I, 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 you, you put a lot of confidence in me there. I don't remember that. Right. Um, the itching and in, in the fingers and the webs make me suggest that he may have picked up scabies. I, um, Very good. Very good. So you see, Doctor Doctor um, Green worked at QPC for quite a number of years. Huh? <laughs> so that's why she able to get these diagnoses. Next one. So the differential diagnosis of a urethral discharge. So the big ones are Neisseria gonorrhea and Chlamydia trachomatis, all right? Mm -hmm. Now in the US and the UK, big ones are Mycoplasma genitalium, Urea plasma urethricum, and very rarely trichomonas. So the big ones in our part of the world is Neisseria gonorrhea and Chlamydia. Of course, we can't test for Mycoplasma urea plasma. We have it and we don't know, all right? But They've been tested for them in the UK and mycoplasma genitalium is a big cause of a urethral discharge. Next one. So how do you investigate some, this patient now? So again, he has a, a discharge. So what you do is you collect some of the discharge, all right? Put it on a, a, a slide and do a gram stain. And you can also culture it on a culture plate using Thea Martin Media. At MRF, for all those people who don't know, we, all, we have available for us the nucleic acid amplification test. So all he has to do is pass a little bit of urine in a special container. You all send it across the tube to MRF and we can do the nucleic acid amplification test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Of course, because he has an STI, you need to screen him for other STI. So you want to screen for syphilis. So VDRL is a screening test and the TPPA is a confirmatory test. Mm -hmm. He says he has HIV, but we just want to confirm it. So you do an HIV test. And what we did was we collect some of that scale, you know, in, on the fingers there. We put it on a slide with my 10% um, potassium hydroxide and looked at it under the scale, under the slide. Next one. So these are the results. Anybody want to shout out the diagnosis? So you can see the gram stain showed um, white cells, containing intracellular gram-negative diplococci. The urethral culture showed was positive for oxidase positive gram-negative diplococci. The nucleic, um, um, nucleic acid <laughs> test was positive for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Mm -hmm. The first test was non-reactive and his HIV test was positive. What's the diagnosis? Anybody? It's right in front of your face. Anybody can get it. You don't have to be a, um, a, a, a SCI person to get it. It's right in front of your face. Anybody with a diagnosis? What you all see in there? Right in front of your face. Dr. Charles from QPCC, tell me what you're seeing. Can you speak? I'm seeing, I'm seeing um, gonorrhea and chlamydia. I don't know if you're hearing Great. me. Great, gonorrhea and chlamydia. Great, good. No, he, go ahead, next one. Right, so that is the 
When you do the smear there, you can see the um, gram negative intracellular diplococci in the, you see Dr. Boyce is showing you there, all right? So that would suggest that the patient has gonorrhea. All right, next one. And this is what we got when we did, when we looked, my mind told you, took some of this, this scale, all right? Put it on a slide and this is what we got. So where's this diagnosis? What does this look like to you all? Looks like a strange organism. What is the organism? As Dr. Green said, this is a scabies. So this patient also has scabies. All right, next one. So where's the diagnosis? So we have some diagnosis so far. We have gonorrhea, we have chlamydia, we have scabies, but then he also had a nodular lesion on the penis. What's that nodular lesion? Dr. Boyce, you want to go back and show them it? He had this nodular lesion on the penis. What's that? This one, what's that? Anybody could get that? What's that? Once you see this once, you'll always remember it. Yeah, Dr. Lech, who is that? I seen Lechren. Somebody's trying to talk. Who's trying to talk? Try and shout it out. All right, well, since somebody can get it, let's go, go ahead, go forward now. Go ahead. So gonococcal urethritis, chlamydial urethritis, HIV infection, and the foreign body is called a domino. Dr. Green, you must remember domino. <laughs> What, what those guys do is they go to prison. That's not fair. Right? right. What they do, they go to prison and they fire along the dominoes into those little balls. They make a slit in the penis with a razor blade, no anesthetic, and put in the dominoes. All right? So that's the dominoes. And of course, he had scabies. So let's go ahead. How we treat this condition now? In terms of gonorrhea, treatment for gonorrhea is keftriaxone, 500 milligram as a single dose. All right? Alternatively, um, I looked it up on the, 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 the British site. You can give a single dose of gentamicin plus a single dose of two grams of um, oral azithromycin. That's one option. Or you can give 800 milligrams of kefixamine, all right? Although they, they, they said that this doesn't provide high or sustained bactericidal levels as keftriaxone, all right? So, the, the drug of choice is keftriaxone, 500 milligram as a single dose. Alternatively, and then we're starting to run out of keftriaxone, you can give um, gentamicin, 240 milligram plus a single dose of azithromycin. Next one, treatment of chlamydia, easy doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days or azithromycin as a single dose. And the others below are alternative regimens, all right? So, we try to use doxycycline or azithromycin. Next one, treatment for scabies. Permethrin, permethrin used to be called NYX. What do you do for scabies? You apply it from the neck down, all right? Make sure you go all between the webs and the fingers, under the nails, on the feet, between the toes. Leave it on for about 12 hours, wash it off, and then reapply in one week. What we have in Trinidad, we tend to have this Kaboma lotion, which is um, gamma benzene hexachloride, same thing. Um, same, same application from the neck down, leave it on overnight, wash it off, and reapply in one week. Now, they also can use malathion, which is not really available in Trinidad, or benzyl benzoate, which is a messy kind of thing that you use once a day for three days. And they recommend that all the patients bed, bed in, clothing, towels, you should wash them at fairly high temperatures, dry them in a dryer, or you could dry clean them. Or what you can do is, you can just Put the clothes in a seal bag and leave them for 20, 20, 72 hours, and that um, destroys the mites. So easy to get rid of scabies, as I say. And with scabies, you need to treat all family members, everybody in the household need to be treated, and all sexual partners. All right, because normally, and on, go back, go back to again, um, Dr. Boyce. No, if you suspect scabies in a man, and you see. These papules and nodules on the penis that gives you, so anybody who's itching a lot, always check the genitals. And if you see these papules and nodules on the genitals in a male, that gives you the diagnosis of scabies. So that's how Dr. Green was able to get it so easily. So there's a clue here. Anytime somebody's itching uncontrollably, if it's a man, check the genitals, all right? And you see those, 
scabies until proven otherwise. Okay, so we go into the, to, what we do after also, we do partner notification. This is basically the process of um, contacting sexual partners um, of a patient with HIV and STIs and advising them that they have been exposed to the infection. So by this means, people are high risk for STIs, okay? A lot of people are unaware of the infection. You contact them and encourage them to come to clinic so that you can do um, testing and treatment. Why we do partner notification? We want to break the chain of transmission. Uh, we want to prevent reinfection the index. Okay, so you treat somebody for gonorrhea or, or chlamydia. If you don't treat the partners and they go back, they could get reinfected with gonorrhea and chlamydia. You want to prevent the complications of untreated infection. And of course, it's your moral duty to inform. Next one. So Tevin, you all remember Tevin, right? Tevin was Jaden's partner. He actually accompanied, accompanied him to the clinic. Tevin is a 28-year-old bisexual male, all right? He had three female sexual partners in addition to Jaden and only used condoms intermittently. All right? He, he, was, he said he was HIV negative and Tevin complained of a watery discharge with very mild burning on passing urine. And you also complain of some growths on the penis too, all right? So watery discharge and some growths on the penis. Next one. Now, Tevin is a very interesting case, huh? Uh, so you can see the watery discharge there, all right? Up and, and below, all right? So you, you, I gave you the differential diagnosis of a, a urethral discharge, so you know that is. Go ahead. You also have these growths on the penis here, all right? Again, you all could try and figure out what these growths might be. In addition, when we examine him, next one, he had this painless genital ulcer that he didn't even know he had. So he had this ulcer in the penis, which is painless, and he had a swollen lymph node in the groin. He didn't even know he had this because these were asymptomatic. Go ahead. In addition, when we examined Tevin fully, he had these lesions on the palms and soles of the, uh, you know? Go ahead. And he also completely said, Doc, I started to lose my hair. I find, you know, I'm here patchy, you know. So, what could Tevin have? Anybody? Multiple things we see in there today. How will you investigate the patient? How will you treat him? And would you offer any counsel? What could Tevin have? Anybody? All right. Go ahead, Dr. Boyce. So remember we did the differential diagnosis of the urethral discharge. We tell you the big ones in our part of the world are gonorrhea and chlamydia. But you also have to keep it in your mind, you have mycoplasma genitalium, urea plasma, urolyticum, and trichomonas. Next one. Now we also look at the differential diagnosis of a, all right, so, so how you investigate it, we did that already. You collect a swab, you do a smear, gram stain, and you do a culture. And of course, you collect some first void urine, the first part of the urine, and we can do the nucleic acid amplification test, which is a PCR test for gonorrhea and chlamydia. Of, of course, because he has an SCI, you need to screen him for syphilis, which we do the VDRL and TPPA, and screen him for HIV also. Next so, one. So, please pause the chat box. Sarah, right. Cyrus Conrad and right. syphilis. Good. Syphilis, Very good. So, in the chat box, so um, people are saying syphilis, penile warts, syphilis, that's excellent. Very good, very good. Go ahead. Now the differential diagnosis of a genital ulcer. The two big ones are herpes and syphilis in our part of the world. But always remember they are chancroid, dolovanosis and LGV. But the two big ones are herpes and syphilis in our part of the world. Next one. So this is how we um, investigate a patient with a genital ulcer. What we do is we, you can do a type specific serology. There's a blood test to see if they have herpes simplex one or herpes simplex two. Now that causes a whole heap of problems there eh? because um, if you do a blood test for herpes, all it tells you is past exposure to herpes. Eh? It won't tell you. So I actually had a patient who um, did a blood test for herpes and he had a genital ulcer and they referred him to me and say that, okay, he had herpes. When I looked at the genital ulcer, just like in this case, I said, but this don't really look like herpes, you know? 
And when I screened them, he actually had herpes. He had syphilis and he had past exposure to herpes. So when they do the type, type specific sorality, that's a blood test of herpes, all it tells you is past exposure to herpes. And you tend to do the IgG, which tells you um, past infection. Because I normally there's something called IgG and IgM. The IgM will tell you recent infection. But with herpes, you can get IgM in both new onset herpes and recurrent herpes. So the IgM is no good value. So when you're screaming for herpes, always, if you're doing blood tests, always do the IgG and it tells you past exposure. You can also do HSV viral culture. So you collect some of the thing on a swab and put it in viral culture medium. Karek or Kafa used to do it, but I don't think we do that. But at MRF, we could actually do the PCR for herpes. So you, you, you can swab the lesion, put it in, 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 in the media and send it to, a, to MRF. And we could actually do the PCR, the nucleic acid amplification test for herpes. There's a test called dark field microscopy. So you can see that Jade now this ulcer. You can go back to the ulcer, Dr. Boyce. What you do is you can take a, a, a microscope slide or you can take a spatula, a brady ulcer there, it's painless usually. You could collect some of the fluid there, put it under a microscope and look at the dark field and you'll see some trepidies and I'll show you that. So your brady ulcer, collect some of the fluid, put it on a, a, a slide and look under the dark field. Go ahead, Dr. Boyce, go for it again. All right, and then we would do the screen for syphilis, the VDRL, and if that's positive, it confirm with a TPP and the HIV test. This is a dark field microscopy where you can see these white little or corkscrew like organisms there. You can probably send, show them at Dr. Boyce with the arm thing. See the little corkscrew like organisms? Those are the treponemes, all right? It requires skilled staff. So QPCC has a person who could do this. Shoba, she's in salt. She's been around for 30 years, so she can do this. And it identifies Treponema pallidum as this motile corkscrew like organism, and it can get an immediate diagnosis, all right? And it can do this for primary lesions and secondary lesions. You can't do it for lesions in the mouth or lesions because they have treponemes in the mouth, all right? Um, so this is dark field microscopy. Next one. So tell me the diagnosis here. So the dark field microscopy was positive. The VDRL was one and one twenty. The TPP is reactive. The herpes simplex one was positive. Herpes simplex two was negative. Uh, uh, Kevin was HIV infected. Smear and culture were negative for gonorrhea. The nucleic acid amplification test was positive for chlamydia, but negative for gonorrhea. What's the diagnosis for Kevin? You all know you will take a bit clinically, but anybody was a diagnosis? So secondary all, syphilis. Secondary syphilis, great. Chlamydia, chlamydia and... Um, chlamydia. Yeah. Um, what else? Well, he's HIV positive. HIV positive, he was negative before. And one more that we saw clinically. That all the, the, the other persons... Oh, you mean the... Um, he had warts, didn't he? Yes, he had genital warts. Candidonga yes. Mm -hmm. Any other thing jumping out at you there that you want to make a comment about? He was negative for um, GC, for gonorrhea. Um, but he and is... Jumping out at you there, that you see there that, you know... Yeah, what's jumping out at me is that he's negative for GC. Right. Um, which could mean two things. Either... He is negative, it, or he could have, you know, had over the counter medication or anything right. like that possible. Okay. Um, but the nucleic acid amplification, this is pretty sensitive and specific. sensitive. Okay. So he, um, but he would have to be treated as a partner, wouldn't he? Yeah, but I mean, he came to clinic, so we, we screen them. So Belinda. Uh, yeah. Says, but says herpes. Says herpes in the past. Right. So past exposure to herpes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's what I want you to pick up. Past exposure to herpes. Yes. Good. Yes. yes. Should end the diagnosis now, Doctor Boyce. Go ahead. So primary and secondary syphilis. He actually had both. All right. Chlamydia. Okay. Genital warts. HIV infection and previous infection with herpes simplex virus. Mm -hmm. Very good. In terms of treatment. 
So for, God, for chlamydia, remember we did that already, doxycycline and azithromycin, all right? But because he was a partner of, um, of Jaden, I'd probably treat him for gonorrhea also because his partner had gonorrhea. Next one. In terms of treatment of genital warts, there's a little thing called podophyllin. Podophyllin is something is where we do chemical uh, cautery burns it off. So it's a little brown liquid. We usually put it onto the warts, we paint it on, tell them to leave it on for three to four hours and then and wash it off and come back in a week. And they do that for a couple of weeks and actually burns off the warts, okay? Or you can use something called imicromod, which is aldara, they use it in Monday, right? Or you can burn it off or freeze it off, all right? Next one. In terms of treatment of syphilis, um, penicillin is the drug of choice. Of course, we have not penicillin in our part of the world for years. All right, benzatine penicillin, long-acting penicillin. Have, that hasn't been available. The pharmaceutical reps say that penicillin is so cheap. It probably costs less than a dollar. So if they bring it in, they're not making any money on it. So they know what to bring it in. So that's an issue. So what we tend to use is doxycycline. So for primary and secondary syphilis, we use doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for 14 days. Works just as well, but penicillin is the drug of choice. Next one. And of course, Kevin said, he only said he had three female partners, but you have to quiz him on bringing all his partners, okay? Mm -hmm. And um, bring them in for testing and, 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 and counseling. All right, so I think that should be the end of my presentation. Any questions, Dr. Boy, hand it over to you. Thank you, Dr. As usual, excellent and dynamic and very uh, uh, involved presentation. Um, so I mean, this is the kind of case we see all the time. Right. And so one of the things we were talking at the, the men's clinic, and maybe I'll just zoom back up and stop share. So the so that's a, a quick plug. So one of the things that we've been doing at MRF for, the, for some of the uh, uh, persons with us today, that we have a men's clinic every Wednesday. And the topic last night was actually on um, Disclosure and partner testing. Right. And it means a partner right. uh, notification, but there's a the right. partner referral provider, a passive, right. and, and that sort of thing. Um, in terms of the your experience at QPCC and at any one um, expertise in the with SCIs, what are our patients most comfortable with in terms of notification? You prefer to do that. Right. So, in terms of partner notification, there are three types of partner notification. So, you can ask the patient to call the partners, all right? Um, and, and ask the patient to bring them in. Or you can ask the healthcare provider. So QPCC has contact tracers. So sometimes, like, I had a patient say, Doc, I meet this girl, she have a red streak in her hair, she have a gold tooth. That's all the patient can remember. Me tell Rio Claro. So the contact tracer, go to Rio Claro, look for this person with a, a red streak and a gold tooth, all right? Because they might know the names. So sometimes they have to do that. Or sometimes they might be comfortable telling the partners, so um, they'll, you'll, they'll give the name and contact and the contact tracer will go out and the contact tracer will just tell them, listen, you came into contact with somebody with the STA, they don't give any names, you want to come in for, for, for testing and treatment. Or there's a contractual um, way you do um, partner notification, where is it, okay, say, listen, we give you a week to tell your partners, if you don't tell them after a week, we will do it for you, okay? So, Usually, the patient can do it, the provider can do it, or the contractual thing. That's what we do. But usually, the, the contact tracers go out and do it. You know, so somebody has lots of sexual partners, the contact tracers will go out and do it. You know, Doctor Green, you want to add anything? No, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it because you know I am I am not working presently, so it makes me feel like if I'm back at work. So this is right. good. <laughs> <laughs> Any questions from the audience out there? I mean, um, question from Tessa, how do you treat dominoes? Dominoes, so what I did was those patients with the dominoes, I actually excise them. So I would put in some anesthetic, make a slit and take it out and then leave it. Because it's easy for me to take it out. They put in it in without any anesthetic. Eh? So when I put in the anesthetic, they said, Doc, this thing come out so easy. I get it so much pain to put it in. So I make a slit and just take it out. Yep, and that's it. Dominoes, once you see it, you always, you know, remember it. So that's why I said, let me show you all it, you know. Any other questions again? 
So I, the take home point is that people could have more than one STI, number one. Number two, we seem to be having an um, explosion of syphilis among men who have sex with men right now. I actually did a paper recently where I looked at, I think, 240 or 250 men who have sex with men and 40 something percent of them had syphilis. So actually what we, we, we just actually finished, we were doing a, so that's what I went back in time. We actually did a prospective study, just how it finished now. So we had a questionnaire and the men who came in, we did a syphilis test on them and we we're trying to see the risk factors for syphilis. So that's what we're trying to do. And all those guys um, who we, we enroll in the study, what we do, we refer them to Dr. Boy, so he'd have some patients for his men's health clinic. So he usually gives them the, um, the, the results of the syphilis test and treats them, you know, and, 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 and um, counsels them. But remember that we have explosion of syphilis among men who have sex with men. Actually, um, that's another quick plug for, for the women's health clinic. So, right. but the problem who know me does the right. The so one of the patients was diagnosed with gonorrhea. Right. Brought in her partner who was right. the patient in the clinic. Right. He had both gonorrhea and chlamydia. And chlamydia, right. And no yes. symptoms. Right, yeah. Completely symptoms. Right. And think about it is normally I'd give a talk in terms of um, the symptoms of gonorrhea. Chlamydia is usually asymptomatic. Gonorrhea, the men tend to present with the discharge and thing. The women, 50% of them are asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. I didn't have time to go through the, 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 the whole thing with gonorrhea and chlamydia. So that's what I'll just show you the cases, you know. Another question from Tessa. Well, raised lymph node is due to HIV or other STIs. Right, so the raised lymph node there, um, the, the, the HIV could cause it, but the syphilis could also cause lymph node. Mm -hmm. Right, so. Syphilis, secondary syphilis is a systemic disease that could cause lymphadenopathy. Yeah. And Dr. Charles wanted to ask a question. Go ahead. Go ahead, Dr. Charles. In terms of um, detecting gonorrhea in women, uh -huh. um, because we do this swab and most times um, that comes back negative. Um, we, yeah, most so of the times we treat them based on a three plus, plus cells. Um, the culture, that too, most times would come back negative. So basically we only treating based on three plus. plus right. so, so what I'm saying is we have the technology at MRF. That's so, what I'm now realizing. So, so, can we... swab. so just do a swab. For, for men, you can do the first word urine. For women, it was swab. Dr. Boyce and they do it. It was swab for the woman and there's a special container. You put it and send it across and we'll do the test for you. Um, okay, because we don't so many samples, we don't do them too often, but you know, we, we, we do the tests, you know, at MRF. So actually, we actually had a meeting with Haku and Dr. Runa, and I mean, they asked her about chlamydia and gonorrhea. She said, well, she's okay with gonorrhea because you all can do culture and things, and she didn't much bother with it, so they didn't bother. But I mean, we can do tests, we can do the um, nucleic acid amplification right at MRF. The okay. same machine that does the, the HIV viral load, that's COVID testing. So Southwest region just called me today. They want to do COVID testing. So the same machine does it. And that same machine also does um, PCR for gonorrhea and chlamydia and herpes and, and hepatitis B and HPV. Question from Cyrus. Can men be positive for gonorrhea but show no reasonable symptoms? Yeah, very rarely. Most of the men, I would say what 80 or 90% of the men with gonorrhea would show symptoms. But some men don't show any symptoms. A lot of people with chlamydia, however, most of the patients with chlamydia, as I say, most of the men may just get a slight discharge, a low artery discharge, but chlamydia tends to be kind of asymptomatic in some people, you know? But they can't look at a discharge and say if it's gonorrhea or chlamydia, because mm -hmm. I've seen a discharge, a watery discharge, and there's gonorrhea, and I've seen a mm -hmm. pearl and yeah. pussy discharge, oh, sure. it's chlamydia. So they can't look at a discharge, you need a lab to diagnose it, mm -hmm. all right? Question from Dr. Rafa, but she said good news. Uh, yes, but only yeah. Interim treatment. Why don't you clarify that a little bit, Dr. Raphael? When you say interim treatment. Treatment for what? Yeah. Yeah, not quite clear. In terms I, of God, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I said great news because I actually was not aware that that was available at QPC, at MRFPT. Yeah. So I'll definitely be um, doing that now, but just wondering, so while we're waiting on the um, results, we go ahead and treat clinically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would go ahead and treat clinically because as I say, um, for the gonorrhea, you can get a smell one time for the men especially, you know, 
Okay, just to, con okay just to confirm, um, exactly, we would take the swab right. and we person it, we can put it in any of the... Um, no, 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 there's a special thing. So, we, again, I let Dr. Boyce probably come across, I'm sure you all, you have to put it in a special, um, it's, a, it's a special swab and to collect the urine, it's a special container to collect the urine in. Okay. So, we, we, somebody have to bring, you have to, you have to use special swabs, so we have to bring those across for you all. Right. And also the herpes testing, we, we will swab the actual ulcer. Yeah, so you swab the lesion itself, all right, and again, put it in a in, in, in special container, all right? Okay. And, um, all right, uh, don't forget something called a T-Zang test for herpes. I mean, mm -hmm. where, where you look for the multinucleated giant. Yeah. So that's not so sensitive and specific. Um, so the, 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 the PCR test is actually better. But again, Thank as you. I said... We don't do it routinely because we don't have many patients, but I mean, they wanted us to do some of that, so. Oh, we could do it routinely. Yeah, we can put, put that in place, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks again for everyone for your participation. Great questions, as usual. So we'll transfer across the to the clinical case. I'm, I'm just gonna start sharing the screen. Make sure everyone tell me if you can see it and make sure tell me if you can hear me clearly. I, I tend to race a little bit sometimes, so let me know. 